another episode of Reasonable Coding. It's been a little while. I've had to put off this particular live stream for a few days due to, uh, let's say, personal things. Uh, but I'm back. I'm happy to be here. So if this is your first stream, Reasonable Coding is a live stream of Reasonable Software Engineering where we will tackle a particular so, um, you know, software topic. Today, uh, in particular, we will be digging, continuing to dig into the OCaml and recent native garbage collector. So in the last stream, let's go here. This is um, episode number 24. That's season episode 4, Understanding the Recent Native Garbage Collector. Um, part two. Oops. The event is live. Cool. Close. Uh, the Camel Garbage Collector is a fantastic piece of software that allows us to write programs that are incredibly fast yet do no memory manage management on their own. It is also the same garbage collector that Recent Native uses. And in this episode, we will attempt to complete the ideas built in part one by exploring how the major heap works and trying, yeah, and tying the whole garbage collection together. In, in the first episode, we we read through two pieces of content, the garbage collection tutorial in OCaml.org, and we began reading the um, Real World OCaml 2 book, especially the chapters on garbage collection. We didn't get too far, as in we didn't cover the whole thing, but rather we stopped after the first, um, the first GC section was done, which is um, essentially the fast uh, minor minor heap. We rounded it all up by having a diagram in uh, Figma that zoom in, I guess I could just suppose, yes, that illustrates how the minor heap GC process happens, right? And we begin with an empty uh, heap, an empty data structure here where as you allocate more, it starts allocating from the end, where the end and the pointer begin at the same point, but um, the pointer points to the beginning of the last allocated block. So if we allocate one, it goes here, and if we keep allocating, it just keeps moving the pointer to the left. Um, the reason to have a base and a start limit pointers, um, pointer and end pointers as separate pointers to the, this data structure is it allows you to do things such as um, set the the end, sorry, set the limit to be the end to automatically indicate that this is completely uh, blocked out, taken. So you can't really, uh, really allocate more memory. And eventually you will try to do an allocation that won't fit. Here we have a red square. This could be a little um, higher in opacity. That looks a little better. The first red square doesn't really fit. The pointer, the size from the pointer um, goes until after the start and the limit, most importantly, right? Which means we need to do a minor GC pass. And in this particular case, some of the blocks will be sent to the major heap and some others will be garbage collected. So that's roughly what we got from the last live stream. Um, this, uh, I haven't made this um, illustration yet, this drawing yet uh, public. I will sometime soon. But hopefully by the end of today, we'll be able to get a major GC illustrated as well. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of how it's going. Let's check that we're uh, live on Twitch and everything works. This should redirect to the event. And it should be take us there in a few seconds. Cool. We're here. And we'll begin in a second. Mm. 
right. <laughs> Understanding the garbage collector. So I'll just go through um, the first parts of this um, chapter very quickly, skim over it. Um, but the section we really want to focus on uh, is the long leave major heap, right? And we're going to be talking a little bit about these titles that we have here, such as allocation on the major heap, memory allocation strategies, marking and scanning the heap, heap compaction, and intergenerational, intergenerational pointers. Interesting. I wonder what that's about I'm gonna have an idea because it's um it does have um, a generational garbage collection algor algorithm all right setting up my phone so I can track uh, the channel here seems to be good everything's good can you hear me well if I get one okay that'll be amazing So let's skim through this. We described the runtime form of individual camel variables earlier. There's another chapter that talks or digs into the representation of the values. And when you execute a program, OCaml manages the life cycle of these variables by regulating, regularly scanning allocated values and freeing them when they're no longer needed. This in turn means that your application don't need to do manually, don't need to manually implement memory management and it greatly reduces the likelihood of memory leaks creeping into your code. Thank you. The OCaml runtime is a C library that provides root routines that can be called from running OCaml programs. The runtime manages a heap, which is a collection of memory regions that it obtains from the operating system. The runtime uses this memory to hold heap blocks that it fills up with OCaml values in response to allocation requests by the OCaml program. All right. So far, so good. We have a mark and sweep garbage, collect garbage collection and a generational garbage collection. Mark and sweep. When there isn't enough memory available to satisfy an allocation request from the pool of allocated heap blocks, the runtime system invokes the garbage collector, which sort of is um, what we saw here, right? When you do the allocations, eventually there isn't enough, and then you have a minor GC pass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> An OCaml program can explicitly free a value when it is done with it. Instead, the GC regularly determines which values are live and which values are dead, that is, no longer in use. Dead values are collected and their memory made available for reuse by the application. The GC doesn't keep constant track of values as they are allocated and used. Instead, it regularly scans them by starting from a set of root values that the application always has access to, such as the stack. The GC maintains a directed graph in which heap blocks are nodes, and there is an edge from heap block B1 to heap block B2 if some field of B1 is a pointer to B2. All blocks reachable from the roots by following edges in the graph must be retained, and unreachable blocks can be reused by the application. The algorithm used by OCaml to perform this heap traversal is commonly known as mark and sweep garbage collection, as we'll explain it further now. And we'll explain it further now. All right, so I would like to first uh, draw this. I, th I know that when I draw things, it's easier for me to remember 
what's going on. So we have a set of root values and we know that we have a directed graph in which heap blocks are nodes, right? And if there is an edge from heap block B1 to heap block B2, then that means there's a field in B1 that is pointing to B2. We can try to draw that. And I'll just create a new frame here. Okay. Swimming in a little bit. There we go. And we will have uh, some rectangle. This will be some of the uh, A block, right? The directed graph in which heap blocks are nodes. So gray rectangles are the heap blocks, and we have one. Actually, I'm just going to duplicate that one because consistency makes things look beautiful. Ta -da. See, that already looks nice. Perfect. And now we have edges between these blocks so long as B1, so something in block 1, right? points to something in B2, which means if this is B1, then there will be uh, some sort of arrow. Do we have arrows here? Ta -da, there's an arrow there. Is that arrow big enough? No. I'll just try to make it bigger faster. I have no idea how to do that. Stroke. I'll zoom in. That should work, right? So this block obviously points to uh, this other block over here. This one doesn't point to that. Now the thing I didn't quite get is that it regularly scans them and them being um, the values, right? Starting from a set of root values that the application always has access to. All right. So essentially there will be some value that will be the stack, right? We can pull it there. And we can just say this is stack. There you go. That's probably not properly centered, but that matters less. And if the stack has actually access to one of these values, right, such as this one, then it's fairly clear to see from here that um, we need to keep the stack around and the stack points to this value, right? And this value is pointing to some other value. Uh, so this value over here could be um, user. And then this value over here, it could be, for example, um, mailbox. So as long as we have a user, we need to keep around the mailbox because obviously user.mailbox will get us the mailbox, ob mailbox object. But um, this thing over here that uh, we could call, I don't know, like um, session. So I want something that is, you know, obviously droppable during the, the pass of the algorithm, but that kind of still reflects, a, you know, a, a semantic connection with the rest of the things. Um, so let's say um, remove the mail. So the moment that we do remove mail, then it's no longer part of the current mailbox or the user. It might be that we can request a different mailbox that includes that, but because we just removed it, it's no longer part of this one, which means we should be uh, free to, to clean that up. Hopefully that example is not... Um, you know, too invented or too uh, superficial and, and sort of sort of makes sense. All right, so going from here, right, we'll See that all blocks reachable from the roots by following the edges in the graph must be retained and unreachable blocks can be reused by application. Okay, so that's sort of good. Like you go through this, you mark all of them as good. So we can take all of them and say, oh, you're actually used. So if we go to some color, let's pick something that more or less reads nicely. Blue, that's not terrible on the eyes. 
the contrast could be better. And this one is unreachable, so we keep it gray. Cool. All right, and then we have another kind of garbage collection, which is called generational, where some things are younger than others, I presume. The usual OCaml programming style involves allocating many small variables that are used for a short period of time and then never accessed again. That makes sense. We have a lot of um, inline or in, in function let declarations. We have a lot of bindings and those are normally used within the scope of a single function and they go away the moment that we have a, a value that our function you know, evaluates to, roughly speaking, that we return. OCaml takes advantage of this fact to improve performance by using a generational garbage collector. A generational GC maintains separate memory regions to hold blocks based on how long the blocks have been live. OCaml's heap is split into two such regions. The small, fi small fixed size minor heap, which is the one where we talked uh, about earlier, where most blocks are initially allocated, and a larger variable size major heap for blocks that have been uh, live longer. Have been live. I'm not a native English speaker, this sounds a little bit odd, but it might be correct, just that I'm wrong. A typical functional prog programming style means that young blocks tend to die young and old blocks tend to stay around for longer than young ones. This is often refer referred to as the generational hypothesis. Mm -hmm. We can quickly uh, search for this. And... It might be something very different. Fourth turning the theory, or simply the fourth turning. It's a pulse rate. All right, we went deep into the rabbit hole very, very quickly. It was created by authors William Strauss and Neil Howe. It describes the theory of recurring generation cycle in American history. Interesting. I wonder if this is the one that we're um, actually supposed to be looking at. I'm going to say computer or garbage collection. Our friend Quora seems to have an answer. Object infant mortality. Holy shit, when you phrase it like that, it sounds terrible. It's a very powerful concept. In other words, most of the objects created in the heap die young. Okay. I was hoping to get something a little bit more academic um, than uh, a Quora answer. So uh, somewhat a point, I will have a look at this Strauss how generational theory and leave a comment saying, yeah, it was the thing or nope, move on. That's not the thing we want to read. There's another thing being quoted here. OCaml uses different memory layouts and garbage collection algorithms for the major and the minor. Hips to account for this generational difference. We'll explain how they differ in more detail next. We have two modules, GC module and OCaml run param. Pa, 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 pa. The OCaml run param is an environmental variable that we can set before launching the application to tweak or control the behavior of OCaml programs. And we are not going to get too deep into this right now. So the fast minor heap is actually not that long. It just, um, it's almost a screen full. And it sort of explains the same thing we see uh, we saw on the on the prior stream. So I'm going to skip this one. Uh, let's go into the long-lived major hip. Okay, so this is the one that we actually want to go through today and hopefully get a drawing like this from before. Done. Cool. So the major hip is where the bulk of the longer-lived and larger values your program are stored. It consists of a number of non-contiguous chunks of virtual memory, each containing live blocks interspersed with regions of free memory. The runtime system maintains a free list data structure that indexes all the free memory that it has allocated and uses it to satisfy allocation requests for OCaml blocks. Mm -hmm. The major heap is typically much larger than the minor heap and can scale to gigabytes in size or gigabytes. It is cleaned via mark and sweep algorithm, sorry, mark and sweep garbage collection algorithm that operates in several phases. We have a mark phase scanning the block graphs and marks all live blocks by setting a bit in the tag of the color, which is the color tag in the block header. The sweep phase sequentially scans the heap chunks and identifies 
identifies dead blocks that weren't marked earlier. The compact phase relocates live blocks into a freshly allocated heap to eliminate gaps in, in the free list. This prevents the fragmentation of heap blocks in long-running programs and normally occurs much less frequently than the mark and sweep phases. Right. So this is the really expensive one where we have to copy all the memory to a completely different uh, free list. Or oh, wait, that's I think that's wrong. But we would have to copy all the memory that we all of our heap, the major heap, into new memory to be able to reorder it, right? To prevent the fragmentation. Then, yeah, of course, we will have a new free list that will be um, pointing to the end of that heap or the beginning, but it will be a contiguous um, chunk of memory allocated in the free list. Anyway, a major garbage collection must also stop the world to ensure that blocks can be moved around without this being observed by the live application. The mark and sweep faces run incrementally over slices of the heap to avoid pausing the application for long periods of time and also precede each slice with a fast minor collection. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't really tell me how often the mark and sweep faces um, run, which might be configurable, might be that we read about it a little um, forward on in this chapter. But it's interesting to see that it precedes each slice with a fast minor collection. So for each one of these slices, right, it will essentially call a minor heap GC, a minor GC pass to clear up this and see if there's anything that should go into the major GC. I don't quite know why, but let's read on and see if we find out. <laughs> Allocating on the major hip. No, sorry. Only the compaction phase touches all the memory in one go and is a relatively rare operation. Allocating on the major heap. The major heap consists of a singly linked list of contiguous memory chunks sorted in decreasing order of virtual address. Each chunk is a single memory region allocated via malloc free and consists of a header and data area which contains OCaml heap chunks. A heap chunk header contains the malloc virtual address of, of the memory region containing the chunk, the sizing bytes of the data area, an allocation sizing bytes used, to, used during heap compaction to merge small blocks to defragment the heap, a link to the next heap in the chunk list. Okay, is there, there's no drawing around here? Okay, I think I will visualize this better if we had a drawing. So, yes. Let's begin with the major heap. Cool. Now I'm going to try to reuse some of these things. They might get in the way, and if they do, I'm just going to remove them. But if they don't, where is the... There you go. And we said, it's a singly linked list, right? So each one of the blocks just has to point to the next one, no way back. Of contiguous memory chunks sorted in increasing order of virtual address. Oops, to the left. So yeah, okay, so none of these things are gonna be useful, but I'll just keep the blocks because uh, colors. So we have one of the blocks here, right? Make it a little bigger. 
and there will be between them a pointer. I guess that should be one sec. I wanna I wanna make the arrow bigger, otherwise it doesn't make a lot of sense to make everything so big. Stroke is this? Yeah, okay, that was it. Good. Cool. So we can remove that and we can keep the red around just for the color in case we need it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Each chunk is a single memory region allocated via malloc and consists of a header and data area which contains camel heap chunks. So consists of a header and data area which contains camel heap chunks. And a heap chunk header contains all of these things. A virtual address, a size, allocation size, and link, right? So we want to write in here that I'm just going to write it as if it was record. This is the header. And the header has the malloc virtual address of the memory region containing the chunk. All right, I think I, I am interpreting it in this way. So this will be the virtual address. I'm gonna have to make this a little smaller in size. So let's go for uh, 14. Oops, maybe a little bigger. Seventeen. We can zoom in a little. Should be okay. Okay. So the virtual address, right? Which uh, I don't know what type this has or what sort of value is. I guess it will just be an integer. The size in bytes. Size. This is bytes. And we also have uh, an allocation size. And then lastly, we had a pointer. Link to the next heap chunk in the list. So this is a next chunk. Right. So at least to me, this helps me visualize way better what each one of these things is. Now, I'm a little confused, confused about the virtual address here. The major heap consists of a singly linked list of contiguous memory chunks sorted in increasing order of virtual address. So each chunk is a single memory region allocated via malloc, right? And consists of a header and data areas which, which contains a camel heap chunks. See, this is the part that uh, tricks me or uh, like makes me trip. Each chunk, right, is a single memory region allocated via malloc. So I would expect each chunk to be a memory region. I'm gonna do them in, well, red is too strong. Oops. Copy. Duplicate, move around. This is new memory, no stroke, or should it, yeah, let's just do a, there you go. This is the new malloc memory, right? And it says, and consists of a header and data area, which contains OCaml heap chunks. So is essentially, is this what this is telling me? that all of this is going to be inside the hip, like that. Opaque, but also like lighter. Is that what is this telling me? Can anybody confirm, if you know anything about this subject, that this is what we should be uh, drawing here? Uh, 
Oh, uh, wait. Another possible in interpretation of this is that... The memory, right, is actually... Um, each chunk is both a blue and a green part, right? Where this is the actual um, heap chunk and this is the header. So this is the data and this is the header. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the heap chunk header... So a header the con that con of which the chunk consists, right, will contain these things. And the chunk also has a data area which contains OCaml heap chunks. Mm -hmm. And the chunk data area starts on a page boundary and its size is a multiple of the page size, 4 kilobytes. It contains a contiguous sequence of heap blocks that can be small as one or two kilobyte pages but are easily allocated in one megabyte chunks. So each chunk is a single memory region allocated via malloc and consists of a header. Okay. Really gonna get this uh, down. Gotta. So this virtual address is the address of this whole block, right? So this will be, for example, block one, right? Now we have a pointer somewhere, and then we can just duplicate this thing for block two and so on and so forth. <laughs> so that's the header over here, right? So we have the header. We also have the data. It contains a continuous sequence of heap blocks that can be as small as one or two kilobyte pages. Okay. And then these drawings are actually multiples of the page size. So I guess it's size in bytes multiplied by that. And it's size. No, it, okay. So this size will always be a multiple of the page size. I wonder if we can quickly do So this will have the size of the block. <laughs> Head and data. All right, so f I think I am getting this. So force could be, could be terribly wrong. Mm. The major heap. But where is this? Where is all this stuff living? The major heap consists of a single contiguous memory chunk sorted in increasing order of. Right, the contiguous memory chunks are this the data slots. 
and each chunk is a single memory region only can be a malloc okay so each one of these will have a very uh, different address but they are ordered what do we say increasing order of virtual address so this if this is this could be 200 and right there you go so that's the first one and then at some other point you have a second one which has a different virtual address and so on and so forth this is the contiguous memory The allocation size is actually how much size we have allocated in this structure. So something like this. Ugh, I'm terrible at this. Why didn't leave more space? Just move it to right. Cool. Which means that if you have two blocks, then you can compare alloc sizes, and if the sum of alloc sizes fit into the contiguous memory of the block size of one of them, then you can merge them, and it's fine. Okay, that sort of starts to make some more sense. Cool. <laughs> Allocating on a camel value on the major heap first checks the free list of blocks for a suitable region to place it. If there isn't enough room on the free list, the runtime expands the major heap by allocating a fresh heap chunk that will be large enough. That chunk is then added to the free list. Okay, so this one's, right, doesn't even need to have to have the same size. So I'll just add a third one to showcase that they can be a very, very different sizes. I think this is a little bit off. That looks better. Okay. The chunk is then added to the free list, and the free list is checked again. And this time will definitely succeed. Right. So if you have this free list. Wait, where is the free list? This is the major heap, right? The runtime system maintains a free list data structure that indexes all the free memory that it has allocated. I wonder if this is the same uh, list. So, when you're trying to allocate something in the in the major heap, right? Do you go first for to each one of these blocks by checking if the allocation size is less? Um, Sorry, allocation size plus what you want to allocate is less than the size, and then you put it there. Or does it keep a similar list of um, blocks as a free list that literally just points to, hey, this is where you can point stuff. You can put stuff. So that then you don't have to go through heap blocks that are full. I don't know. I do not know. 
it would be great to know that. Remember that most allocations to the major heap will go via the minor heap and only be promoted if they are still used by the program after a minor collection. The one exception to this is for values larger than 256 words, that is, 2 kilobytes on 64-bit plat platforms. This will be allocated directly on the, ma on the major heap, since allocation on the minor heap will likely trigger an immediate collection and copy to the major heap anyway. Which makes sense. Memory allocation strategies. The major heap does its best to manage memory allocation as efficiently as possible and relies on heap compaction to ensure the memory stays contiguous and unfragmented. The default allocation policy normally works fine for most applications, but it's worth bearing in mind that there are other options too. Mm -hmm. The free list of blocks is always checked first when allocating a new block in the major heap. The default free list search is called next feed allocation with an alternative first feed al algorithm also available. Okay, I'm getting the vibe that there actually is a separate list of free memories. The free list, right? So this is the ma major heap itself. I'm going to make this a little uh, smaller just so we can. I'm going to take this to the other rectangle. Bam. Now, I would like to know how the free... Uh, list is written but since it's using the term as there you go as if it's something that already exists I presume that it will be replied somewhere okay and we have it here uh, so data structure is in a scheme for dynamic uh, memory allocation it operates by connecting unallocated regions of memory together in a linked list using the first word of each unallocated region as a pointer to the next Mm -hmm. Free lists make the allocation and the allocation operations very simple. To free region, one would just link it to the free list. To allocate a region, one would simply remove a single region from the end of the free list and use it. If the regions are variable sized, one may have to search for a region of large enough size, which can be expensive. Free lists have the disadvantage inherited from linked lists of poor locality of reference and so poor data cache utilization and they do not automatically consolidate adjacent regions to fulfill allocation requests for large regions, unlike the body allocation system. Nevertheless, there are still useful in a variety of simple applications where a full-blown memory allocator is unnecessary or requires too much overhead. Interesting. So we have a linked list, right, where the first word mm, of each unallocated region is a pointer to the next. So I don't know if in reality what happens is that here, right, in this, uh, in this particular block, we do have a word that points to the next freely, uh, freely available one, and I'm gonna essentially make up some values here by putting a slightly darker green right I don't know if this is what's going on let me finish it first and then we can go through the through the thought process right so I do not know if there is a pointer between these two things right that is maintained oops, from the outside so that when you go to the free list you know that you're pointing to um, the first available of free uh, the first piece of available memory so that this works like this free list right you have this reference there, and the first element is this one, and then you can go to the next one, and so on. And this just points to major, uh, sorry, free spaces inside of each one of the heap chunks. I do not know if this is the way that it works, or or if it just so happens to be 
a completely separate data structure, right? That that includes the same pointers. Uh, I I just need to get that there. Cool. Uh, from what I hear here, right? We're actually going through the list trying to see if what we want to fit in memory, right, finds one of these chunks that is big enough. But if this was a pointer directly to the free memory, there will be no metadata on it to be able to tell, oh, you wanted to allocate 10 words, this thing has four. You can do it. That's right, you can't do it. So I'm gonna assume that there's a separate data structure for now. And if they happen to be use, uh, using the same one, then great. Free list. So it will be something like this, I presume. Where, yeah, head, and then you have blocks, and each block has essentially a pointer to the free memory a size right like a free size maybe next uh, free chunk and then uh, chunk address something like this I don't know uh, I I'm just trying to understand what is it that this looks like on memory. It would be a little un actually it might might be that it's not unpractical, even though you have to go through the whole of the blocks in the heap to be able to check. It might be that you never end up having that many heap blocks, right? If this can be fairly big, then I reckon that if you have, you know, one, two, and then four gigabytes, or one half, and then uh, three gigabytes. Then may maybe you just have to check, you know, three up times. It's not that much. Uh, it might be that uh, in practice, even though this will be a traversal that a worst case will be O N, right? You you don't pay that much of a penalty for checking each one of the heap blocks. I don't yet know if. Um Anyways, I'm. This is me just. Uh, What's the word? Conjecturing? Trying to guess what's going on. So I'll continue just with the allocation strategies here. Next feed allocation keeps a pointer to the block in the free list that was most recently used to satisfy a request. When a next new request comes in, the allocator searches from the next block to the end of the list and then from the beginning of the free list up to that block. Next feed allocation is the default allocation strategy. It's quite a cheap allocation mechanism since the same heap chunk can be reused across allocation requests until it runs out. This in turn means that there is good memory locality to use CPU caches better. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for that particular um, If we were to draw that one in particular, we will begin with a list that looks like this, right? Actually, I'm going to copy the header as well. I don't yet know why it sometimes copies the things I select and sometimes it doesn't. Can I make this bigger? Here you go. And this will be um, memory allocation strategies. Uh, 
and we can a little lower yes and yes the first one is going to be next fit where we're gonna I'm gonna remove all some of this metadata right I don't think we need it right now So what happens here is that first we try to allocate on the first one until it's full or we it doesn't fit and then we go on to the second one and so on. So I'm going to clean this one. Oops. And I'm going to clean this one. What did I do? Did it duplicate that? All right. Actually, we don't need a third block to um, to illustrate this with two is fine and I also think we can make this smaller so we have our first allocation here and then we have our second allocation to the right right and then our third allocation actually has to fails there so we're gonna put another block we're gonna color it red cool so then that ends up moving to the next block I mean, I'm assuming that this block actually fits in here, so I'm gonna have to make this a little bigger. Oh, right, so when I remove something, it automatically copies it to my uh, paste buffer. Interesting. Cool. Now I can take this one and, uh, sorry, take the green one, color it red. Right, then we remove this one, we put this in there. Perfect. Can move this a little bit to the right. Duplicate it. And bam. Do you have three blocks there? Yeah. Okay, that can go away. All right, so that's one, two, three, four. That's sort of how next fit seems to work. You try to allocate here, and if it fits, you continue using it. Mm, so now we can write a little bit around it. Yeah, we can say um, current block. And we'll add an arrow there. Can we align this? Yeah. I think it aligned with something else. There you go. Is that is that it? Perfect. Brilliant. Cool. So now we have the first one. It's a current block. And then we try to allocate. So we can write... Um, I think I'm going to... This might not be entirely obvious. There are different things. So if I remove the fill but I have a stroke around it. I don't know. Not an expert in these things. Did 
they look separate enough. I think they do, but... Fifty-four, fifty-four. What's the difference between these two? Thirty-six. And then here we have thirty-one. So we probably want to move some stuff inside it. Just a little bit. Okay, so that's thirty-six. That clearly leaves us with a bunch of stuff here that needs to be more or less centered. Okay, that worked. And we can move that a little bit more. Thanks for the location, so um, one, two, three, four. One. Three and four. Cool. Right. So that's sort of how I see it. We begin with one, we have a current block, then we allocate something else that fits, and then um We try to allocate something else that doesn't fit. So we can like. New block is too big. Or rather doesn't fit. So we go. the next block and we we continue using that as the current block and that will continue working through the memory until it exhausts it Whew. right so the first feed allocation, if your program allocates values of many varied sizes, you may find sometimes you may sometimes find that your your free list becomes fragmented. In this situation, the GC is forced to perform an expensive compaction despite there being free chunks, since none of the chunks alone are big enough to satisfy the request. First feed allo allocation focuses on reducing memory fragmentation and hence the number of compactions, but at the expense of slower memory allocations. Every allocation scans the free list from the beginning for a suitable free chunk instead of reusing the most recent heap chunk as the next feed allocator does. For some workloads, that needs more real-time behavior under load. Sorry, for some workloads that need more real-time behavior under load, the reduction in the frequency of heap compaction will outweigh the extra allocation cost. Okay, now we go into marking and scanning the heap. We're halfway through this thing. There's a mutable write barrier, and then there's um, another point on finalizers, which we also discussed uh, on the prior prior live stream. I forget which number of episode it is, but it's definitely on YouTube. <laughs> Marking and scanning the heap. All right. The marking process can take a, a long time to run over the complete major heap 
and has to pause the main application while it's active. It therefore runs incrementally by marking the heap in slices. Each value in the heap has a 2-bit color field in its header that is used to store information about whether the value has been marked so that the GC can resume easily between slices. So I have colors here. And blue means that it's on the free list and not currently in use. White, not reached yet. This is during marking, right? But possibly reachable. White during sweeping means that it's unreachable and can be freed. <coughs> Gray, it's reachable, but its fields have not been scanned. And black means that it's reachable and its fields have been scanned. Okay. The color tags in the value headers store most of the state of the marking process, allowing it to be paused and resumed later. The GC and application alternate between marking a slice of the major heap and actually getting on with executing the program logic. The OCaml runtime calculates a sensible value for the size of each major heap sliced based on the rate of allocation and available memory. Interesting. What does sensible mean here? What compromises is it making? The marking process starts with a set of root values that are always alive, such as the application stack. All values on the heap are initially marked as white values that are possibly reachable, but haven't been scanned yet. It recursively follows all the fields in the roots via a depth first search. Mm -hmm and pushes newly encountered white blocks onto an intermediate stack of gray values while it follows their fields. When a gray value's fields have all been followed, it is popped off the stack and colored black. The mark of an impure heap. To mark an impure heap, the GC first marks it as pure and walks through the entire heap block by block increasing an increasing order of address. If it finds a gray block, it adds it to the gray list and recursively marks it using the usual strategy for a pure heap. Once the scan of the complete heap is finished, the mark phase checks again whether the heap has again become impure and repeats the scan until it is pure again. Mm -hmm. Marks it as pure and works with the entire heap block by block in increasing order of memory address. If it finds a gray block, it adds it to the gray list and recursively marks it using the un usual strategy for a pure heap. Once the scan of the complete heap is finished, the mark phase checks again whether the heap has again become impure and repeats the scan until it is pure again. These full heap scans will continue until a successful scan completes without overflowing the gray list. Controlling major heap collections. The space overhead setting controls how aggressive the GC is about the uh, slice size to a large size. <laughs> this represents the proportion of memory used for live data that will be wasted because the GC doesn't immediately collect unreachable blocks. Core, and this is uh, OCaml Core, a library by Jane Street, Jane Street Core defaults this to 100 to reflect a typical system that isn't overly memory constrained. Set this even higher if you have lots of memory or lower to or lower to cause the GC to work harder and collect blocks faster at the expense of using more CPU time. Right. Mm. Marking and scanning the 
And I reckon that after that comes a sweeping. It burns incrementally, marking heaps in slices. The camera runtime calculates a sensible value for the size of each major heap slice based on rate of allocation and available memory. Okay, so the first thing it does is marks everything as white, right? And then going from the roots, it goes into a def first search and puts any white blocks that it found into a stack of gray values. Right. So everything is white because it's not reached yet, but possibly reachable during the you know marking phase. And then, as you go through the um, the graph, you will be marking things as gray until you reach the very bottom of the you know the edges of it, which won't have any. any children, any other blocks they point, point to. So going back to this drawing that we had over here, right? So if these are different, um, or this one over here, mm -hmm. this one will be a white block and this one will be white as well. And then it will reach this one. But as it moves from this one to this one, it will mark this one as gray right possibly reachable not reached yet sorry gray was reachable right we have reached it <laughs> but its fields have not been scanned right so this will just color this whole graph um, white to begin with right and then it will start crawling it or going do going deeper um, Sorry, traversing the graph in depth first search so that every node that it touches will become gray, right? Which means they will be reachable, but its fields have not been scanned. And once it reaches the last one, it will mark that one as black, which means reachable and its fields have been scanned. And then as it goes up, it will keep marking gray values as black. <laughs> it recursively follows all the fields in the roots via depth for search and pushes newly encountered white blocks onto an intermediate stack of gray values while it follows their fields. When a gray values field have all been popped, it is popped off the stack and color black. This process is repeated until the gray value stack is empty and there are no further values to mark. There's one important edge case in this process though. The gray value stack can only grow to a certain size, after which the GC can no longer recurse an intermediate values since it has nowhere to store them while it follows the fields. If this happens, the heap is marked as impure and a more expensive check is initiated once the existing gray values have been processed. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, it's right, 
didn't it say that it marked the, the thing as pure at the beginning? Pure. No? Okay. I imagined that. So this is colored into gray. Which is convenient because it's gray right here, right? So if I... Um, I'll just copy this thing over here, and this will be marking the marking algorithm. Um, these are set to white, if I understood it correctly, right? Yes. All values in the heap that are initially marked as white values that are possibly reachable uh, but haven't been scanned yet. Cool. So uh, we will have uh, number one. The first thing is that you take this and you turn it into white. some reason this one got in the way uh, we probably want to also add them a border so we can see them so we got a stroke black and this is also marked as white and it will have a stroke as well oops I just saw that we have a, a message from Sam to run. I did not see this before. And yes, I think so. I think it is. So in the second step, right, step number two, the values that are reachable are going to be marked as gray. No, that's the stroke, my bad. Right. And after uh, the scanning, some of these values are going to be mapped to black. So I possibly want to change this first into white text. So if there is any white um, values, right, after the marking process is done, it means those values are unreachable. unreachable. Yep. That is sort of it. This is much more complex than the um, minor GC. But uh, it's fun. Yay. 
All right, so if we get into the process, there's no not enough stack to actually pop, uh, sorry, push the gray values in there, then the heap is marked as impure. And the more expensive check is initiated once the existing gray values have been processed. To mark an impure heap, the GC first marks it as, a, as pure and walks through the entire heap block by block in increasing order of memory address where each one of the heap blocks is uh, the ones that we saw here, heap block 1, 2, and 3, sorry, 1, 2OA, and FF2, right? If it finds a gray block, it adds it to the gray list and recursively marks it using the usual strategy for a pure heap. Once the scan of the complete heap is finished, the mark face checks again whether the heap has again become impure and repeats the scan until it's pure again. Whoa. These full heap scans will continue until a successful scan completes without overflowing the gray list. Couldn't you run into a situation where you have too many gray blocks? And could, could you, you, you run into essentially a fixed point where running this GC over this particular heap block just doesn't change it anymore? So it's the same, it's the same value, it's the same heap, it frees nothing, and then this process will never end. I don't know, maybe, maybe. You can trigger a single slice of GC via the major, uh, the major slice call, as we saw before, major slice zero, it returns an integer. I don't know why. And then int full major returns a unit. So you can run full major to run the whole thing. Cool. Space overhead is so where you control to see how much um, space will be wasted during GC. Setting controls. The space overhead setting controls how aggressive the garbage collection is about. setting the slice size to a large size. This represents the proportion of memory used for live data that will be wasted because the GC doesn't immediately collect unreach unreachable blocks. Core defaults is to 100 to reflect the typical system that isn't over overly memory constrained. Set this even higher if you have lots of memory or lower to cause the GC to work harder. Okay, so this is only to, to be able to mark <coughs> The whole thing, right? It doesn't really talk about um, the cleanup. <laughs> hmm. And we have heap compaction and intergenerational pointers. I'm not entirely sure. I think that this also describes how how or when we clean the memory. But I can't remember, I can't find also here any anything that points to Yeah, at this point if you find a white node it's unreachable uh, unreachable and then we'll just clean it. Remove it. Or rather add it to the free list, right? Hmm. Let's let's continue. Heap compaction. After a certain number of major GC cycles have completed, the heap may begin to be fragmented due to values being deallocated out of order from how they are they were allocated. This makes it harder for the GC to find a contiguous block of memory for fresh allocations, which in turn would require the heap to be grown unnecessarily. The heap compaction cycle avoids this by relocating all the values in a major heap into a fresh heap that places them all contiguously in memory again. A naive implementation of the algorithm will require extra memory to store a new heap. heap. But OCaml performs the compaction in place within the existing heap. Okay, so it's a good algorithm. Mm -hmm. You can control the frequency of the compactions, 
The max overhead setting in the GC module defines the connection between free memory and allocated memory after which compaction is activated. A value of zero triggers a compaction after every major garbage collection cycle, whereas the maximum value of 1 million disables heap compaction completely. The default settings should be fine unless you have unusual allocation patterns that are causing a higher than usual rate of compactions. Okay. And lastly, we have intergenerational pointers. One second. One complexity of generational collections arises from the fact that minor heap sweeps are much, much more frequent than major heap collections. In order to know which blocks in the minor heap are live, the collector must track which memory heap blocks are directly pointed to by major heap blocks. Without this information, each minor collection would also require scanning the much larger major heap. Right. So essentially, if you have a pointer from the major into the minor, then the minor sweep needs to be aware of it to be able to not collect those immediately. Ocaml maintains a set of such intergenerational pointers to avoid this dependency between a major and minor heap collection. The compiler introduces a write barrier to update this so-called remembered set whenever a major heap block is modified to put to point at the minor heap block. Okay. Okay, so this is why we need to care about the mutable write barrier, right? The write barrier can have profound implications for the structure of your code. It's one of the reasons using immutable data structures and allocating a fresh copy with changes can sometimes be faster than mutating a record in place. The OCaml compiler keeps track of any mutable types and adds a call to the runtime camel modify function before making the change. This checks the location of the target write and the value it's being changed to and ensures that the remember set is consistent. Although the write barrier is reasonably efficient, it can sometimes be slower than simply allocating a fresh value on the fast minor heap and doing some extra minor collections. Let's see this for ourselves with a simple test program. You need to install the core benchmarking suite via Alpam install core bench before you compile the code. We're just gonna read through the code very quickly. We're not actually gonna execute uh, this. We define two types. One has um, just integers and uh, float and the other one has mutable versions of uh, the same fields. And that's a test for mutability and immutability, where essentially in the mutable one, we are recursing and iterating by modifying the record in place. And on the second one, we uh, iteratively recurse, right? We call ourselves again with uh, a fresh copy of the data structure that was passed in after we modified it. And we run this for, what is it, a million times. We run both things a million times. Mm -hmm. Defines a type T1 that is mutable and T2 that is immutable. The benchmark loop iterates over both fields and increments a counter. Compile and execute this with some extra options to show the amount of garbage collection occurring. So that's the name of the file, barrier bench. Cool. So when we build this thing, right, and we execute it, we say ASCII and location and quota one. I reckon these are flags to to core bench, and we'll see that the mutable actually takes longer, about forty percent longer than than the immutable one. Huh? There's a stark space time trade off here. The mutable version takes significantly longer to complete than the immutable one, but allocates many fewer minor heaps, heap words than the immutable version. Minor allocation of camels is very fast, and so it's often better to use immutable data structures in preference to the more conventional immutable versions. 
On the other hand, if you only rarely mutate a value, it can be faster to take the right barrier hit and not allocate at all. Right. The only way to know for sure is to benchmark your program under real world scenarios using Core Bench or I guess other benchmarking libraries if there are others and experiment with the trade-offs. The command line benchmark binaries have a number of useful options that affect garbage collection behavior. Right. The no compactions and stabilized GC options can help force a situation where your application has fragmented memory. This can simulate the behavior of a long-running application without you having to actually hit, actually wait that long to recreate the behavior in a performance unit test. Very interesting. There's a little bit of on, on final asset functions that I'm not going to get into today. This is going to be a short stream compared to the other ones that are usually three to five hours long. I think we're going to go back into the um, diagrams and see if we've got what we needed out of it. If we can do essentially the same walkthrough of the minor GT on the major heap, then I'll be happy to call this a day. Okay. can start reading by here and then going through the drawing and make sure that the drawing makes sense as well, right? Allocating an OCaml value in the major heap first checks the free list of blocks for a suitable region to place it. So the first thing that it does is that it goes through these blocks in the free list, right? And it tries to find one that actually uh, has space for it. Because the default allocation is uh, next fit, right? then if we were working with this one, this was our our block, our current block, right? As we see here in the next fit allocation, then we're gonna use it until we can fit something in there and then we're gonna go to the next one or the one before. Mm. If there isn't enough room for the, on the free list, the runtime expands the major heap by allocating a fresh heap chunk that will be large enough. That chunk is then added to the free list and the free list is checked again. This time it will definitely succeed. So if we had a chunk of memory, let's say we're trying to allocate this, uh, the green one, the one in the, in the middle there, right? I can't seem to be able to click on that. Okay. Then we will check on the first one, right? And it really doesn't fit. And then we'll go on to the next one. And it also doesn't fit. And we don't have more memory, so we need to request a new block. And then it will request this block and it will allocate it there. And then our free list will actually have, so the reality is that first it gets a new block that's completely free, right, like that, bam. And then it adds it to the free list and then it starts all over and says, yeah, actually I can go in there and also I can go in here and then it goes to the new block and says, oh wait, yeah, I can absolutely be there. And then boom, it's placed there. Um, cool. So that's how we get um, essentially things allocated and more memory requested. This is like 83% right. I'm not entirely sure if it's correct. It's just what I've understood from reading and trying to draw through the process. Uh, so I think that the Worst case scenario is a good intuition of what's happening. Best case scenario is a good intuition of what's happening. I wouldn't take this as the source of truth. Okay, so now we know how to put data into the heap and that would happen from a minor GC pass. We send a few things to major and then it goes through a free list and says, okay, I'm in this block already. Let's say it's in the second. Can I allocate something here? Yes, no, if you can't, then he goes to the next one and say, can I allocate something here? Yes, no, and if you can't, right, then um, it will uh, request a new chunk of memory, a new uh, heap block, and it will be put here, and it will be put in the major, in the, um, 
in the free list, right? So there will be another square here. And then it will start over from scratch and say, okay, can I put things in here? In this particular scenario, it happens that yes, you could put it in there. So I wonder if it will just go there, right? Uh, but if it also can fit it here, then it will just go no, 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 and it will fit it in the new one. So that's how I see it happening. Cool. So we covered only the next feed allocation strategy where you reuse the same block until something doesn't fit and then you move on to the next block that does fit something in it. The first feed allocation essentially will um, go through the whole of the list saying, does it fit here? Yes, put it there. And then it will say, does it fit here? Um, no, okay, does it fit on the next one? And then, yeah, okay, put it there. And then so on and so forth until it, um, it essentially uh, goes through the whole list and there's no more free memory and you need to request new memory. Now, let's see how we actually collect this memory. So the marking algorithm takes the memory that we have here, right? For each one of these um, blocks, it will mark all of the different pieces of um, values that we have in them, right? That are, let's say we can draw them in a graph, like the one that we have here, where each one of them um, essentially or camel values will be a node. I think it, it was not the camel values, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna search for node and see. Heap blocks, right. And the blocks are essentially this ones, right? Which are stored in a single or across different uh, heap chunks. And they're all going to be marked white for first, even the ones that have no way to get to them. They're, you know, we don't know that yet. Where white means during the marking means, um, essentially, I haven't looked through this. Not reached yet, possibly reachable, right? And then it begins at the, the roots where in this case we have a single root, which is the stack, right? And it will go through the stack, marking everything get gray until it reaches the last one. And by that I mean, for each one of the blocks, it will go through all of the pointers that a block, all of the, all of the blocks that another block points to, and it will recurse until it reaches the end. Once it's reached the end, it will, um, it would have had all of them painted gray. What happens here is that as it begins in stack, it will say, okay, I'm in stack right now and there's a pointer, so I'll mark stack as gray, right? And I will go to the pointer. And it will do the same thing with user, there's a pointer, let's go to mailbox, and it will do the same thing with mailbox. I'm in mailbox, let's paint it gray, right? But it doesn't have any pointer, so we can paint it black. And then it goes back and says, oh, user already has um, all of its, you know, further down pointers being checked, so we can mark it black as well, and then we go back to the stack and do the same thing. And what we end up is with um, this whole graph that's painted black against all of the other nodes that are still painted white, right? And then the the actual um, um, sweep can happen. There's an edge case here where the amount of space we have to keep a list of the gray elements, gray, you know, blocks is bigger than the actual space we have for uh, for allocating new memory. And that's a little bit fussy to me. But if we glance over that one, which I guess we could uh, reread at some other point, we can begin the sweeping. And in the sweeping phase, essentially, we'll be able to get rid of all of the, the nodes that are white. Because if it was marked as white originally and the marking algorithm didn't actually paint them anything differently, then that means those blocks are unreachable and can be freed. Now, I didn't read anything about sweeping here. It's marking and scanning, heap compaction, but yeah. 
I'll assume that because we keep a free list, right, that has pointers to uh, free, uh, free chunks inside of um, of the data of of the data area inside of each one of the heap chunks, then I'll assume that um, the free list will have that essentially will have that um, that space reclaimed. So it w that space, the po a pointer to that space will be added to the free list. And then we could consider it cleared. And that will be the sweeping. Wow, I was not flaky on that uh, last explanation. <laughs> like I felt my voice crackling. Anyways, I think this is an, an intro. I'm not gonna say it's a good introduction to the subject. I'm not an expert in garbage collection. I'm just trying to figure out what the hell is it going on and you know how is it that my programs can run so fast without any memory management themselves. It seems that a camel is taking very, very interesting um, compromises here to make to make the programs not have to care about garbage collection and still provide quite quite a lot of raw speed. I think the um, the functional programming approach really fits very nicely with uh, with this mix of, of of collection strategies, right? Where the generational one essentially tells you every little variable that you put is gonna die soon, so we understand that. Don't worry about it. And the ones that live long are gonna live longer. And yeah, I think. Unless I don't know, uh, we have one two people watching. It's a small audience this time. It's a little. Bit, it's way too early for my usual time, so it's fine. If you have any questions, maybe we can try to answer them. But I'm again, I'm not an expert, so it might just be that we want to play around a little bit with the GC module to understand better. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I see maybe Centron is still online, but I also don't see the comments and things. So I'm gonna go here. Right then, I think that after these drawings, I have a better understanding of how we see that my program can handle memory automatically, starting from the minor he uh, heap and its automated um, passes that happen every every time that we try to allocate something it's, that's no longer there, and how that goes into major heap, which is a much more long-lived, more much more longevous, longevous uh, piece of memory, and how that memory is both managed and also compacted over time and how is it used uh, how is it that we traverse it to be able to allocate new objects in it and lastly how is it that the marking algorithm goes through the whole data that we have inside each one of or across these heap chunks right to be able to um, to delineate memory that can be freed. Well, I'm a little more knowledge knowledgeable than I was uh, two hours ago. I hope you are too. I hope you enjoy this as well. And I will link to these drawings so that they can be accessed from, you know, uh, from the description on YouTube. Then again, if you liked what you saw, you can um, go to events and subscribe to following a future events that are going to happen there's actually one in today like soon very soon uh, i'm going to push it to later tonight i think or tomorrow since uh, today's not that long uh, and if you are liking this or or had to you know pop out and come back in you can always go to um, the channel in youtube which is um, YouTube slash C slash reasonable coding. You can also search for the name and you'll find it there. And we have, um, a f oh, look at that, an increasing subscriber base. That's uh, getting really nice. And, you know, the, the more people look at the videos, the more they, uh, they, they want to look at them, the more time I'll be spending on um, on editing them so it's easier to consume after live stream but naturally as they are they will be available as well so if you go to videos you'll be able to see all of them last one we had uh, five days ago building a design system in recent ML yes. and this one will be here too 
All right. Thank you so much for staying, for being a, being a part of this. I have learned a lot. I hope you have too. And I will go now. Have a good day. And as always, stay reasonable. See ya.